turn in our Bibles today. We're going to go to Luke chapter 2 to begin with, and I'm excited as we start a new series here in December leading up to Christmas. And this is our Christmas series that we're calling Here We Come a Caroling. And I uh, just want to help remind us of the reason why we sing. The reason why we sing at Christmas, we sing because Jesus is the reason for the season. Can you say amen? And uh, so we rejoice in that. And what we're going to do is kind of look at different carols leading up to Christmas. And also, let me remind you, if there's any that want to go to the uh, intro to faith class, now is the time to do so. I told Dell I wouldn't forget and I saw him. So it reminded me, go through this back door if you're interested in the intro to faith class. Maybe you're new in your faith or wanting to get grounded in your faith right through the back door here and the first door on the right after that so if you want to do that that would be great but uh, we're gonna get right into this and look at a carol today and then draw some biblical connections together with that and see how God would use it to encourage us and so as we go through this series let me encourage you this is the time of year people begin to think a little bit about uh, going to church invite somebody out to church but let me encourage you as well to be faithful and come on out and let's be encouraged together and let's also draw closer to the Lord in this month can you say amen And use this month to remind us what this is all about. It's about Jesus Christ. So let's dig right in. The carol I want to focus on today a little bit, and I am going to preach from the scripture. Don't misunderstand me. But we want to think about O Holy Night. How many love that song, O Holy Night? And that that seems to be the climactic song of Christmas so many times. Let me share with you a little context and a little understanding here about O Holy Night that maybe we weren't aware of, kind of give you a little bit of a history lesson. O Holy Night was actually written in the 1800s, somewhere around 1847, they say. And what's interesting is that there was a parish priest that wanted to have a special poem that he could share in a service. And so he asked a guy in town to write a poem for him that he could use. Now, this guy that he asked to write this poem was a French merchant and a poet, and uh, he was known to write really good poems. And so he was the one that was approached there in town. His name was Placide Capot. And what's interesting is that Placide was not a Christian, but yet the parish priest invited him to write this poem because he was such a great poet. In fact, he was known to be around town to, uh, to be a little bit of a troublemaker but yet he was a great poet. So he asked him to write this thing and to put it together. And so this guy, who was very far from God, not really including God in his life, he didn't go to church, yet he was a good poet, wrote this poem, and he used Luke chapter 2 as kind of the outline, as kind of the, the pattern of which he would go with this poem that he was about to write. And Placide loved the poem so much that he asked a friend of his to set this poem to music. And Adolf Charles Adams was the guy, also not a Christian, who put this poem to music. And the rest is history, as they say. The poem, this new song that was used, became so popular that it ran through the Catholic Church. It became this uh, overnight sensation, if you will. It was met with embrace and enthusiasm. People loved this song, and it was played for a long time in many, many churches because it was just a great one that everybody seemed to get a charge out of. But here's the problem. When everybody realized who wrote the song, who put the song to, or wrote the poem and then put it to music. These were not Christians. They said, we don't want anything to do with it. And they tried to get it out of the church. At that point, it was too late. It had already taken over. People love it. And here we are. We still sing it today. What's kind of interesting is that several decades later, about six decades later, in 1906, there was this guy named Reginald Fassenden, who was a 33-year-old Canadian professor, and he did what many people thought would be impossible. He made a makeshift transmitter, plugged it into his generator out in his garage, and then he put a microphone into that transmitter, and he broadcast what would be understood as the first AM radio broadcast. What song do you think he put on? That very first, you know, they say, what's the very first uh, song that was put on MTV? Anybody know that one? Video, uh, yeah, exactly. Video killed the radio star. Well, here's the very first song on radio was Oh Holy Night. 
And before he played that song on his violin, he read out the scripture, Luke chapter 2. And he gave them an understanding of scripture there. And what would be spoken was certainly this Christmas story that we're all so very familiar with. Turn to Luke chapter 2 with me. If you haven't already, I have not, and I apologize for that. And it tells us there, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken out of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were also some shepherds saying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold... I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Amen. Aren't you thankful that Christ the Lord has come? First scriptures placed out on the airways, the first song, O Holy Night. And the scripture is a great reminder to us today of what Christ has done and come to do for each of us. Let's pray. Father, we just bow our heads, we bow our hearts here today. We thank you for a few moments to get into your word and to be reminded of what Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us. I pray today that you would minister to hearts all over this room and anybody that might even watch in the future on YouTube, God. We just pray, God, that you would use the gospel to make a difference in people's hearts today. And if we've come in heavy burden today, I pray that we would rejoice because of the hope that we have in Jesus. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read to you the lyrics of O Holy Night. It says, O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O oh, hear the angel voices, O oh, night divine, the night when Christ was born. The title of the message, if we need one, is O oh, night divine. And what I want us to understand is today we have every reason to experience the thrill of hope because Jesus Christ is born. Can you say amen? We have every reason to be filled with hope and joy. What a night that had to be. Just think for a few moments. We can only imagine what it would have been like to be there on that holy night. Now, I know we look at a major scene. We look at that scenery and we see Joseph and Mary in this quaint little manger of some sort, and the cattle are lowing, right, and whatever that means, and, uh, you know, there's goats there well-behaving, not running around and headbutting you like most goats I've seen in my life, and the sheep are just sitting there quietly buying, right? I'm sure it was a little different. Anybody think it might have been a little different than that? I mean, that's a beautiful, picturesque way to look at this whole thing, but it's probably a little different. The reality of the story is here is a teenage girl that is pregnant, uh, miraculously pregnant, and a teenage young man that are traveling on a donkey. Some would say 80 to 100 miles. Any ladies remember being pregnant and great with child? Did you ever have a moment you're just like, man, I can't wait to take a nice long donkey ride? <laughs> huh? That's probably the last thing on your mind. I want to go on a long donkey ride. Here they are because of this census, because they had to take this trip, and they've taken this long donkey ride. She is going in labor. Huh? I, I remember Angela going in labor, right? 
And, and I, she wasn't saying, hey, let's go rent a, a horse and take me to the hospital, you know? Uh, she, we were in the car, I remember, with Alex. We were in the car ready to go get lunch after staff meeting at church. And she goes, man, I keep having these pains. And I'm like, well, how far apart are these pains? And uh, this was after the storm of 96 down in New Jersey. I mean, we were snowed in for days. And this was like the first day to actually get out. We were in the office, had our staff meeting, leaving for lunch. And I had to shovel my way out because you know how it always goes. You clear the yard, the plow truck goes by and fills the end of the yard back in. How many know what I'm talking about, right? They fill it back in. And I'm out there helping the old groundskeeper get the yard shoveled out so we can actually get out. And she's in there watching the clock on the car, you know, on the radio in the car to see how far these pains are apart, about five minutes apart. And then they're getting, guess what, closer. And, and here we are rushing up. There's a little bit of chaos. We call the doctor. Hey, what's going on? He says, well, I'm glad you called because we needed to call you. This is something that we got some concerns about, you know, so on and so. It makes it all the more fun and exciting. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Abby, similar way. We had a piano recital uh, the night before, and then Angela goes into labor early that morning, and here comes Abby, and we got to drop Alex off to the babysitter, get in, and then things weren't moving the way. It probably wasn't as picturesque and as neat and kind as we see the manger scene, right? So we know it's a little bit different there. We have all the pleasures of doctors and nurses and all the resources of the hospital behind us, but there they are in a stable. How many get grossed out doing the dishes at home? Uh, my daughter, she, we think about doing dishes. Ugh, you know, that's not her thing. They're in a stable having a baby. You know what I'm talking about? Not clean, not perfect, nobody there. It's just happening. Oh, night divine. Huh? It smelled different, wouldn't it? Absolutely. So here they are, just trying to get through. Oh, night divine. The stars are brightly shining. This was the night of our dear Savior's birth. I want to zero in on a phrase for just a moment of that song, O Holy Night. And there's a phrase in there that I want to just springboard off of today to remind us a little bit about what Christ's birth really means to us on that divine night. And it's that phrase there in the psalm that says, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. And that's the seventh slide, honey. I know I've skipped over everything and messed you up really bad. I'm so sorry. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. Could we say weary world real quick? One, two, three. Weary world. You did so, so with that. I'll give you that. Right? Weary world. Think about that. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. We live in what we could call a weary world, don't we? We could look around and say, man, with everything we see happening in our world, and maybe with everything you see happening in your life, you might feel like your world is a little bit weary. Maybe you feel like you're treading on water. You're just trying to keep things going just to make it by. Maybe things aren't going great like you'd hope they would. We look around our world, we think about uh, the situation we see with North Korea and all these threats that are coming around us. We think about the world we live in as a weary world, a difficult world. Politically, there's a lot of unrest on one side or the other. Maybe there's things going on in your life relationally with a family member, or maybe even with your spouse. Maybe stuff at your job is not going the way you hoped it would. Or maybe you wish you had a great job. Huh? The world sometimes seems a little weary, but we've got to never forget what the song says, there's this thrill of hope that has come. What's the thrill of hope? Just imagine that maybe, just maybe, in the midst of all the chaos and all the darkness and everything that people were experiencing back in the times that Jesus was born, think for just a moment, there were still some that had put their faith and their hope that there would be a Messiah that would come to save them. Throughout the Old Testament, there are prophecies 
There are people that were saying there is coming a Messiah throughout all the Old Testament. We see this story, this thread line coming through that there will be a king that would sit on the throne of David. Amen. And it would be Jesus. And they're waiting for him to come. Just think in all the mess and all the weariness of the world and even that intertestamental period where there was just no revelation from God whatsoever. No word. There are still people hoping and waiting for that thrill of hope when Jesus would come, the Messiah would finally be here. And we hear a hint of faith in that phrase, a thrill of hope for a weary world. Why? So we can rejoice, so that we can lift up our heads and be happy once again. You think about a weary world, I want you to take your Bibles and flip back into the Old Testament and read from the book that speaks of weariness, it's Lamentations. Remember Jeremiah? What do we know him as? The weeping prophet, right? And if you flip back into Lamentations, kind of the idea, the backstory there, a little bit about what was going on in the Old Testament in the book of Lamentations, the context there is about 586 B.C. Jerusalem has fallen. The people were distraught, as you could imagine, with everything that was going on. They were upset because of what was taking place because Jerusalem had fallen. Talk about a weary world. Jerusalem, this is the picture. This is the idea. The city of God, it's fallen. How do you think their hearts felt? How do you think they were responding in the midst of that difficulty? Certainly they were distraught. And the prophet Jeremiah was lamenting, as you can imagine, right? Lamentations, lamenting, get the connect, anyhow. And so here he is lamenting. We can't forget, though. Lamenting is just not mourning. It's just not being, oh, woe is me. Lamenting is not just a complaint. It's also a profound request for help. Remember that the next time you read Lamentations. It's not just the doom and gloom. It's this profound expression of help, God. I need you. He was hurting along with everybody else. The people were hurting in this weary world. And look at Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 20. It says there, Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. Now, if you take a moment and you listen to the words from the heart of Jeremiah, there's some amount of pain there. He says that his soul is bowed down within him. He is mourning. He is sad. His soul is downcast because of the tragedy that took place. But he doesn't stop writing there. He remembers something. And it's not about ignoring the severity of the circumstance. Those are significant. They are life changing difficulties. He acknowledges that, but he stirs something up within himself. He says in verse 21, I recall this to mind, therefore I have hope. What does Jeremiah still have? Help me out. Hope. He still has hope. Hope. Jeremiah refuses to allow himself to lament and mourn and cry. He begins to turn this into a request to God for help, and he keeps his hope up in the midst of that. He knows that things are, yes, very serious, but he doesn't allow that to occupy his mind entirely. Instead, he says he's going to call out to God for his help and his truth in the midst of this situation. And because of his memory here, because of his recollection, here of God. Jeremiah was able to have hope in the midst of a very desperate situation. And that's what many of us, actually, that's what all of us need to do. When we're in the face of the weary world and the difficulty and the trials and the pain, God would call each of us to stir up something within us so that we can have what? Hope. We need to remember something so valuable 
about God and what he's done in us. When we come to the communion table, we remember back to what Jesus has done. What should that do for us? Remind us of what Christ has done for us, that he loved us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us and he cares for us and he loves us. And he didn't save us just to say, now you're saved and go figure it out. He saves us, but he also walks through everything that we walk through with us. He doesn't say, I'll meet you on the other side. He says, even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, you, you don't have to fear any evil, for I am what? I'm with you. He goes with us. It should give us hope. It should build us up. He says, I know one thing to be true about God in verses 22 and 23. We've heard these verses many, many times, but maybe in context, they add a little bit more of richness to it. But it says, the Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. His compassions, what? They never fail. They are new every morning. And here's this thought again about morning, a new day, great is your faithfulness. The awesome part here is that Jeremiah proclaims that God's great compassions are there when every new morning, every new day, and there's that thought of morning coming to us once again. And let's make a connection here from this carol, O Holy Night, in those lyrics. It says, for yonder breaks what? A new and glorious morn. When Jesus came, it was a new day for each and every one of us. When Jesus was born in that stable, some say it could have even been a cave, when he was born in that messy, smelly place that was not all that quiet, not all that comfortable or sterile, but when he was born, a new day rose. Now, I don't know if it was six in the morning or three in the morning or if it was noon, but when he was born, this is a new day for all of humanity. Because in the meantime, there was this weariness. We had to continue to go back to the priest. We had to continue to say, would you atone for my sins and bring a sacrifice and all these things. Now Jesus would be the sacrifice. You hear me this morning? This is a new day for us. That's why there can be a thrill of what? A thrill of hope for this weary world that rejoices. This is what God does for us, not just for Jeremiah and not even for this guy we know as Placide who wrote this poem. This is what God offers to every single one of us, the brightness of a new day that is found in him. So allow me a few moments here today to kind of unpack some things for you as we understand what a new day in Christ brings to each and every one of us. Number one thought is this. A new day in Christ brings us him. Now, I know that sounds almost simplistic, and I've already said that, but bear with me. In other words, a new day in Christ will bring you exactly what you need. Him. He is what we need. Now, understand, I said what you need and not what you want. We don't always get what we want, but what we need is a very different thing. Look at verse 24. It says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, and therefore I will have what? Here's that word again, hope in him. Understand that every now and then, just like we see Jeremiah, he encourages himself, and every now and again, you and I have to encourage ourselves in the word. That's why I encourage you, and we should have some amount of biblical literacy. We should be reading our scripture to encourage ourselves, to strengthen ourselves, to build us up in our faith. That's what he begins to do. He recalls some things to mind. Can you say amen? That's what begins to happen. He stirs it up by using the word of God, what he understood about God, what he remembers about God. And he begins to say some things to himself and encourage himself in some things. You know, David talked to himself in the same way. There was a time back in 1 Samuel chapter 30 that David was greatly distressed, it says there, and uh, he was being pursued. Actually, they were talking about stoning him, and uh, he, he begins to talk to himself and encourage himself in the Lord. 
He began to remind himself about what God had done in his life, how God had worked in his life. And you know what? You and I have to do that at points in our lives when we are in that weary world moment. We have to build ourselves up with the scriptures and understand that God is for us. He's not against us. Amen. He loves us. He cares for us. He's working on our behalf. This is what Jeremiah did. He remembered something special, that the Lord is his portion. And because he remembered that God is his portion, he could have hope in God. Now, the Lord is my portion. What in the world does that mean? That God is our portion. It can mean a number of different things, but a lot of scholars, smart people, tell us that it means something like this. You remember back in the Old Testament, when Israel was wandering out in the desert and God fed them something that was called manna. Do you remember that? And they were being fed manna out there and when they would get up in the morning, they would find their food spread out all over the ground. It rained down from heaven, right? God, it just was there. And what would they do? They would go out and they would gather up enough manna to feed themselves for that day. Now, you remember, if you read any part of that, uh, that if they gathered ahead and tried to store up two days, what would happen to the extra portion? It would rot. It would go bad. And so they had to go out every day and collect together what they needed, their portion for that day, what they needed for that day and only that day. And it has become a reminder to us that when God provides us manna, what he gives us is our portion for the day. A lot of us like to stock up. A lot of us like to save up. A lot of us like to kind of get ahead of the things and once and done type of thing. And maybe I can go for a few days and not worry about it. It doesn't work that way. Jesus is our bread of life, isn't he? But he's that bread that we have to come to on a daily basis to get our portion for that day. We need him. He's exactly what we need. And we come to him to be our daily bread. In the New Testament, we're told this, when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he told them to say this, give us this day our what? Our daily bread. Not our weekly allotment. Not our monthly stipend. Give me my daily bread, God. And so every day we come to him, and that's what Lamentation says, the Lord is your portion, therefore have hope in him. He will give you what you need for today, to make it through this day. He will give you what you need to make it through tomorrow in this season of your life and what you need the day after that for this season. And here's the good news. God is already involved in your tomorrow and he has everything you need for your tomorrow, no matter what it brings. God is there to bring it to you, to bring you through it, which should what? Give you hope. Philippians 4.19 says, this same God who takes care of me will supply all my needs from his richest glorious riches, which have been given to us through Christ Jesus. God promises to take care of our daily needs on a daily basis. You know, John Piper said this. He said, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, but you may never be aware of more than three of them. We don't ever understand all of what God is doing, but he is doing something. We don't always understand how God is doing it, but there he is doing it. You might only know one or two. You might only be cognizant of a couple of the things, but how many times have we been told, hey, you don't know about the accident God prevailed you and kept you from. You don't know the sickness that God didn't allow to come to you that tried to, you know what I'm saying? We don't know what kind of stuff could have befallen us that God has prevented. But yet when he does allow certain things to come, he says, I will be your portion. Oh, holy night, that night when Christ came. What's the second thing a day with Christ brings us? It brings us hope. I've said it over and over and over again. We have to talk about hope, that second thing. Jesus will bring you the hope to keep on going. This is the thrill of hope that comes in this weary world. This is the thrill of hope. 
and faith in God when we see all this darkness around us and we can't seem to see which way is up. It is the belief that there's a new morning in the midst of the chaos. Some of you walking through difficulties and trials and struggles right now. Some of you with sickness in body or maybe situations with family or maybe it's a financial burden in your life and you're walking in the midst of this weary world experience right now. Understand that the Bible says in verse 25 of Lamentations 3, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. There's a secret here that God is good to those who wait on him. We want everything now, don't we? We want things to be, just be done and over with. God, wave your big, awesome, sovereign hand like a magic wand and say abracadabra and just fix it, God. And you know what? God many times just wants us to wait on him, trust him, rely on him to carry us through it. If he just fixed everything all the time. I mean, think about your own children. If you always just took care of every single thing, their beck and call, what have you raised at that point? Us. Uh, I hear some of you, I'm going to use your words, a spoiled brat, right? A spoiled child, right? And God is not a genie in a bottle. God is a God we trust in his timing and in his way because he's sovereign and he is Lord and we're not. And we wait on him patiently but we know in whom we are waiting on and we know that his heart is for us and not against us. And we know that he's faithful and he's kind. Therefore, we can have hope. Why? Because we know that he wants only the very best to come about for us. He says, I give you a what? Future and a hope, right? That's why we can wait with patience and goodness there, and believing. You know, it's said by many, and you know, this is debatable in, in, in our medical world, but 40 days or so that you can live without food, right? Some say eight days or so you can live without water. Others say you can live four minutes or so without oxygen. But we can only live really a few seconds without hope. A life without hope. What's that look like? What's that feel like? Maybe you've had moments in your life, you felt as though, man, there's no hope. Life changes drastically at that moment, doesn't it? Life becomes so very different. Friends, we need hope. And it's hope in God. We don't need to live a hope-deprived life. We need hope in God. You know, a lot of us are really excited right now. Maybe your 401ks or your... <coughs> Bank accounts are looking bigger because the stock market's going up. We can place our hope in that kind of thing, but I, I, listen, we know that that can go as quick as it comes. That hope is not secure. You follow me? Only secure hope is found in Jesus Christ. And we need to be careful that we focus on that thing. I, I came across this statement about hope by G.K. Chesterton. And he said this about hope. He said, hope means hoping when things are hopeless and it is no virtue at all. As long as matters are hopeful, hope is merely flattery or platitude. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to become a strength. Let me break it down for you. When we hope for something and it's still looking good, is that really hope? He's saying that's not really hope, it's still looking good. But when everything looks terrible and it's down and out and you still have hope, that's when your hope can become your strength because you're trusting God. You're hoping in him against all odds. Isn't that what faith in Hebrews 11, 1 talks about? Hope does not discourage. It doesn't let you down. Even Hebrews 10, 23, it says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. That's what Hebrews 10, 23 says. I love that picture. Hope is something to grip a hold of, to hold tightly to, with white-knuckled expectation. I'm trusting God. Grab a hold of it, Christian. Believe God to work in your life. That's hope. 
hope that we profess and never let go of it. Don't ever let go because God is faithful. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And I believe the challenge for you and me today is that many times in the midst of our life when all hope seems gone, we're letting go of the very hope that could sustain us. And we're grabbing hold of the reality that it seems like all hope is gone. Doesn't seem to make sense, does it? We lay hold of the, oh, it just seems like it's all falling. God's saying, grab hold of hope in spite of what you see. In spite of what you're experiencing. Don't let go of it, then hold on to it. Romans 5, 5 says, this hope will not lead to disappointment. This hope that we're holding on to in Jesus Christ doesn't lead to disappointment. It leads to good things because God is working on our behalf. Can you say amen? The last thing that I want to remind you about today, a day with Christ will bring you also his help. He will bring you the help that you're seeking. Listen, Lamentations 3.26, it is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes you have to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Some of you may be sitting here, I don't know everybody's situation, maybe you're waiting silently and what you need is salvation. But maybe there's some already, you're in the family of God, but what you need is to be saved out of a difficult circumstance or a situation that you're facing. I'm always amazed. And I want you to never lose sight of this fact here, this one thing that you can't fathom what a difference a day in Christ can bring. We don't know what's around the corner for us. We don't know what tomorrow has in store. You might be really holding on for something, believing God to do this enormous thing, but right now it doesn't seem like it's there. We don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't know what is going to happen tomorrow for us. And so he can bring us that help. Let me illustrate it to you in this way. You remember a guy in the New Testament named Lazarus? Mary and Martha's brother. They sent word to Jesus. He's dying. He's sick. Jesus doesn't show up. When Jesus finally gets there, Lazarus has been dead four days. He's already in the grave. It's too late. If you, if you just come sooner, Jesus says, well, don't you have faith to believe? And, oh, yeah, we believe in the resurrection. They missed what Jesus was talking about. He walks up to this tomb and faces this grave and says, Lazarus, come forth. What a day, huh? What an awesome day. We don't know what one day can look like. After everything seems gone, the Bible says he was rotting. At this point, he stinks. Leave him alone now, God, right? It may seem like the situation's gone and everything stinks but we don't know what one day with Christ might be like. You don't know what God has for you tomorrow. What about this other person we know is the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years? 12 years, pain, agony, uh, being an outcast, no help from the doctor, just hoping it would get better. The difficulty of her situation there every day as she would wake up, there it is. The embarrassment and the humiliation how her life became like it was just her and nobody else because she was unclean. But she saw an opportunity one day. And she interrupted Jesus working. If you remember the story, I think it was Jairus that he was talking with. She jumps in the middle of his Bible story and grabs the hem of his garment and instantly she's made well. That's one day. We don't know what one day can do for us, huh? How about this other guy that was just waiting? He was lame from his mother's birth. For 38 years, he was unable to walk, laying by the pool of Bethesda, and there was one day Jesus came up. We know the end of the story and what happened. He walked away. 38 years he couldn't walk. 
But all of a sudden, he walked on that day because of one day. Help came one day. Listen, I don't know where you're at in your journey. I don't know what's going on in everybody's life situation, but we don't know what today might bring before the sun goes down. We don't know what tomorrow might bring when the sun comes back up. We don't know what might happen on Wednesday for somebody. Are you with me today? Do you hear me this morning? This is why we hold on to hope. This is why we trust God to do what no man can do because he is the one that is able far greater than anyone could ever do in your life because he is able to bring us the help that we need in our lives. Romans 13, last verse, I'll let you go. This might become one of your favorite verses It says in verse 11 and 12 of Romans 13, do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than we have believed. Verse 12, the night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. What did it say there? The night is almost gone. You don't know how close to the gone of night you are right now for the new day to come. You hear me this morning? The night is nearly over. The day has come. Like they always say, it's always darkest when? Right before the dawn. I remember we were waiting, you know, for a long time we waited to have a second child. I don't know, maybe not everybody knows Angela had a birth defect. She should have never been able to conceive a child, carry a child, or give birth to a child. We didn't know this until... Alex was coming. You remember the five minutes and then the four in the car and me shoveling and we didn't know any of that. It just happened. We thank God for that. And the doctor said, never, don't ever, don't ever be happy with what you got. We said, fine. We moved to another city, go to another doctor. He says, I've seen a million of your cases. Angela was like an anomaly. Nobody's ever heard of her situation before. Uh, She's probably in a textbook because they took pictures and We were in a teaching hospital, and we probably had 40 people sitting in the room with us that day when Alex was being born. She loved it. She thought it was great. Um, But we moved to Buffalo, New York, and she found a new doctor, and the doctor said, we've seen this situation hundreds of times. You can have another child. And we tried for years, I think near three years, and we got to the point where, like, forget it. It's just, that's just forget it. Maybe God's just wanting us to be grateful for what we have. And next thing you know, she was pregnant. And then forget the doctor saying, you know, it's when people try so hard and hard, and when they finally just relax and give it up, then it happens. And he'd seen that over many times, he said. You know what? It always seems darkest right before the dawn. And when we're ready to <coughs> let go of hope, then help comes. I'm not advising let go of hope today. But that was kind of our attitude. We'll just leave it in the Lord's hands. And you know what? We still were hopeful. We were still believing. We had scripture verses we were holding on to and trusting God to accomplish. And he was faithful. Not because we're anybody special. But know this, that help will come. Day is, night is almost over. Day is coming. O oh, night divine. Huh? What an awesome, awesome night that was. The change that has come into our lives because of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let me read those lyrics one more time. A thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks what? A new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices. Oh, night divine. The night when Christ was born. I propose to you that our lives have changed drastically the night Jesus was born. They're forever different. And you might be sitting here today and not feel like it's very different. Let me encourage you to tap into that hope one more time. Because Jesus has come, you have a reason to hope today. Because his help is on the way for you in the midst of the situation that you're facing. 
Can you say amen? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Are you facing something today? And it seems like only night. And it seems like, man, this is a mess. And I'm never going to be able to get through this thing. Romans told us that night is almost over and day has come. Is there something you're holding on to? You're trusting God to get you through the night season. Is there a night season you're trying to make it through? You need God to help you through that. Would you just raise your hand today? I want to pray with you. Thank you. Anybody else? You're in a weary world situation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, thank you. All kinds of hands. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. God, today I want to lift up my brothers and sisters. I'm asking that you would help them, God, in their weary world situation. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity that you have brought to us to be our help, to be our hope. And I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you would be with each one that raised their hand, and God, may be those as well that didn't, but they're in a weary world situation. I pray, God, that you would let a new day come to them. And God, that the thrill of hope would flood their hearts and minds even now. May this message and what you've spoken to us today encourage us to hang on to hope and believe you, God, to do what only you can do. I'm asking God that you would show up in their situation and you would break through in the darkness and bring a brightness of an awesome new day in Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus has come. And because of that, we have this thrill of hope. God, restore hope in each of us today. God, there may be some here, they're so weary, so worn out, maybe feel like Angela and I did to some degree, who just let it go. God, I pray that you today would strengthen us to grab a hold of hope once again. And Father, that you would in turn bring the help that we need in you. I thank you that you're here for each of us to guide us, to lead us, but also to help us, God. Be our help in time of need. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.